Hello and welcome everyone. This is Lisa Harrison and today I'm speaking with John Lamb Lash. Today is the 20th of December here in Australia and for those of you who are not familiar with John and his work, John's an author and a researcher of the Gnostic and Nagamadi text and the person probably solely responsible for putting the word archon into the modern lexicon and we will get into that as part of our discussion today but we are going to talk quite a bit about Sophia who and what she is and the Sophianic myth so welcome John thank you it's good to be with you uh, it's lovely to talk to you again it's been a few years and I have been familiar with your work on and off over the years probably over the last four or four or five and there's a lot to it and and approaching this subject is a tricky one because it's probably one of the hardest ones i've actually had to prepare for in the sense of any aspect of this story feels like pulling a string and the whole thing kind of unravels um, but you, it's the Sophianic myth. Let's start with Sophia. Let's start with who she is, what her creation is, and what the myth is. And I just wanted to actually, before we get into it, the way you were introduced to me, and I want to see how accurate this is, was that you are somebody who is outside ac academia who took the scraps, so to speak. When the academic world looks at the, the Nag Hammadi and all the Gnostic texts, they have quite a considerable percentage of it that they throw into either the too hard basket or the not for public consumption basket. And it is that material that you have spent a great deal of time on and therefore have come out of your research with a very different view and different story to what the academic world have put forward. Is that accurate? Yeah, I'd say that's a, that's a pretty good introduction to what I've done. Yes. Great. Okay. Well, having cleared that up, let's move on. Who is Sophia and what is the Sophianic myth? Well, Sophia is a goddess. It's the name for a particular goddess. And the Sophianic myth is the biography of that goddess, the story of her life, as it were. And where did she come from? Who is she? Well, when I say Sophia is the name for a goddess, it's a leading line. I would uh, suppose that that statement, reaching the ears of people listening, might provoke a typical response, which would be, oh, oh yeah, goddess, name for goddess. I've heard about that, right? Tell me, have you, Lisa, heard of the names of certain goddesses ever in your life? Sure, I guess my, the, the Greek gods and goddesses. So name one goddess you've heard of. Isis. Okay, Isis, Egyptian. How about Athena, Greek? Athena, Greek, yeah. Aphrodite, Greek. Mm -hmm. Ishtar, Babylonian, mm -hmm. okay, uh, Ishpapalotl, Aztec. Are they all uh, could... personifications of Sophia? No. There are many, many names of goddesses in the repertoire of world mythology, okay? And everybody knows it, and most seekers and people who are investigating the truth about life on this planet have looked into mythology for answers. True? True. What I have found, first of all, is a very great fact and then a massive inference from that fact. The very great fact is that of all the goddesses who are named in the various diff different cultures of the world, there is only one genre of mythology, only one source where Sophia is named. She is the goddess in a particular mythological narrative that comes from very particular sources. 
So you, even though Sophia is a Greek word, it means wisdom, it's the basis of the word philosophy. Philosophy means the love of wisdom, philo Sophia. But even though Sophia is a Greek word, she's not a Greek goddess. You won't find a Greek myth about Sophia, nor will you find an Egyptian myth about her, or a Babylonian, or a Hindu myth, or an Aztec myth, or a Chinese myth, or a Polynesian myth. So I want to emphasize at the beginning to people who maps perhaps are picking up on this message of mine for the first time, that I'm talking about something absolutely unique. I'm talking about a singularity in the imagination of the human species. Okay? Mm -hmm. Do you think she's That's been deliberately Sophia. omitted? From well, the, the, the story about Sophia, the sacred myth of the Aeon Sophia, as the Gnostics called her, Aeon is the Gnostic word for God or Goddess, A-E-O-N. So I like to use the term the Aeon Sophia. It's a reverential term which recognizes her status as a galactic being, okay? Mm -hmm. She is a galactic being, and we'll get to that point when we get to the story. But setting up the story is important, so you'll bear with me for a minute here, okay? Yep. Oh, the way we go into it, the initial conditions of approaching this story are important. So what I'm wanting to get across here is first that it is a very great fact, it's not speculation or a claim, that the myth of Sophia, the biography of this goddess, comes from one source only, the Nag Hammadi Coptic Greek writings. And you are absolutely correct, and this is another very great fact, these writings only come down to us in a pitiful, fragmentary form. Why is that? I often compare it to a shattered mosaic. Can you, can you get that analogy? Yep. Imagine if you went into a train station or, you know, often on the walls of train stations, they would have a great mosaic on the wall. And imagine if there was a war that destroyed the train station and the mosaic was blown into, into shards and you gathered up a bucket, gathered up a basket of fragments of this mosaic and you had to put it together from those fragments. That's what I did to restore this story. And the fact is that there is no other story, no other narrative known to human beings that has ever been so repressed and attacked as this story. So the reason why many people who know mythology fairly well, you know, for instance, they may know and love the Egyptian, as you know, or they may, they may love the Greek, goddesses Aphrodite and so forth, Persephone and her mother Demeter. Reason why until this myth was restored from body material, two people John, I'm, lo I'm losing I'm losing you. I'm losing you. You are? Yeah. Really? Yeah, you cracked up quite a bit there. Well, that's funny because I usually, I've had excellent internet feed here. And you're back quite nicely now. <laughs> yeah, just... but when, did you, when, when you start to lose me, you have to yell ouch. Okay. So I don't say things and then I don't know when you started to lose me, you see. Can you say about when? The, just how suppressed this story has been. Okay. The fact is that most people in the world never heard this myth until the Nag Hammadi materials were found. Mm -hmm. Because this narrative, this myth, unlike the myth of Isis or the myth of Kuan Yin, a Chinese goddess, or the myths of Sarasvati, a Hindu goddess, they have not been repressed. They have not been re re uh, destroyed. You can go and read lavish accounts of these myths, but there is only one source of the Sophia myth. Try to register this. The reason is that this myth has been subject to the greatest repression and destruction of any story known to the human species. 
Is it because it's the most empowering to the human species? That's exactly right. You used the word empowerment when we were talking before we started to record. Mm. You said you would like to leave people with a sense of empowerment. Well, I can assure you that the sacred myth of the Aeon Sophia, which was the centerpiece of the pagan mysteries before Christianity, is the most empowering narrative in the world. And the reason for that is simple because it is the narrative of the earth itself. It's the biography of the earth. So where do we start with the story? Well, we start where the story starts, before the earth existed and before humanity existed. According to the materials that the Gnostics left, now Kamadi, and other Greek and Latin language materials related, which have to be pulled together for all the clues you need, you know, to restore this story. According to them, the story begins in the center of our galaxy. Not the center of the universe, the center of this galaxy that we inhabit. Is that clear? Mm-hmm. And Do you know who Ed, Yeah, yeah, she's a galactic goddess. That's right. Sophia is a galactic goddess. She's a star goddess. And the story of her biography begins at the core of our galaxy. Now, I guess people know who Edwin might not know who Edwin Hubble is, but people have heard of the Hubble telescope. Mm-hmm. And what do those photos of the Hubble telescope show us? Billions of galaxies, right? Mm -hmm. Billions. Many of them are spiral or pinwheel galaxies, right? You yep. can picture that, okay? Yep. We know that there are billions of them in the universe. So I would define the universe as the totality of all the galaxies. The story of the Sophia is a story about this galaxy, the one that we're in. It's not a story about any other or about the origin of the universe itself. And the story begins by saying that at the center of our galaxy, the hub, there exist gods and goddesses, and they are definitely gendered. You could think of them as positive and negative charges, okay? Mm -hmm. They're not to be pictured as anthropomorphic forms, they're not angelic. They're not even powerful animal forms, although the power of the Aeon Sophia is often pictured as an animal, most often a lion. Okay? Gotcha. So, at the center of our galaxy, which is a four-winged, four-limbed lenticular spiral, is a core, and the Gnostics called it the Pleroma, which means the fullness, the plenitude. And in this pleroma, which consists of a pure light energy that is alive and substantial, by the way, the light energy of the core of the galaxy is substantial. It's material. It's like nougat. It has a substance. And this is pure star matter of which stars are formed, but there are no stars at the core of the galaxy. There is only this raw matrix of divine living light. Mm-hmm. Is that picture clear? Yep. And in this light, there are various massive currents. You can imagine them as, as, as you can imagine it as a vortex of massive serpentine currents. And these currents, which are inconceivably huge and immense by human standards, uh, are the aeons in the pleroma. And they are described as dancing and swirling around within the boundaries of the galactic core. Could this be what is also referred to as the void? No, this is not the void. The void is more like the space of the universe in which all the galaxies float. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's not the void. It's material. Don't have to go into any abstraction with it. Okay. Just keep thinking materially. You know, Edwin Hubble, after whom the telescope was named, was the astronomer who discovered in the 1930s 
that we are in a galaxy. Until then, at least in modern terms, I'm sure ancient people knew it, the Gnostics knew it, but in modern terms, astronomers didn't know that the solar system is located in the third limb of a four-limbed lenticular spiral. So Edwin Hubble was the first person who led to that discovery. So now we know what the shape of the galaxy is, and it is not a void. It is an actual material object. You might imagine the galaxy like a huge millstone. At the center is the pure divine living light of the aeons, and then the four limbs consist of heavier, heavier matter, realms of heavier dense matter where planetary systems arise. There are no planets in the core of the galaxy. There are no stars. The stars and the planets manifest in the spiral arms around the core. This is pure astronomy. Mm -hmm. But the, the myth of the Gnostics of Sophia is an astronomical myth, pure and simple. So the myth says that the gods and goddesses, the aeons, in this core of our galaxy uh, amuse themselves and entertain themselves by creating experiments. Now it so happens that because of the structure of spiral galaxies and because of the material structure of evolution on the cosmic scale, planetary worlds arise and dissolve constantly in the outer limbs of the galaxy. Solar systems, stars, and planetary systems are constantly arising and constantly dissolving in the arms of the galaxy, okay? Okay. That's the big picture. Well, isn't that picture confirmed now by science over the last 10 years? Mm -hmm. Who has not heard about the ma many, many discoveries of other planetary systems like ours? Yep. Right? Yeah. So according to the Gnostic perspective, what we would do today to align ourselves with their visionary powers is to, is to realize that these planetary systems, like ours, that arise in the galactic limbs are like laboratory settings. And what the aeons do is that they concoct experiments with living creatures, with living plasms that generate creatures, that is to say DNA templates, yeah. And they project these DNA templates out from the galactic core by a kind of process of filamentation. There are filaments of plasma that go out from the core, although the aeons themselves remain inside the core. And on those filaments of, of plasm, they send out the seeds of life. They send out DNA templates, which they have invented freely because they want to see these experiments unfold in all of these many planetary systems and planetary worlds. Yep, I'm with you. So that's, okay, you got the picture so far. Yeah, so, I love the way you're telling it. It's very visual. It's beautiful. Well, this is an astronomical myth, and I can tell it in a way that is entirely consistent with contemporary astrological data. Now, the Gnostics said that the aeons do this all the time. This is how they entertain themselves. They live for countless billions and billions and billions of years as long as the galaxy they inhabit uh, is existing. And the wonderful thing, one of the things that, that I find really wonderful anyway about the Gnostic myth is that it concentrates and it focuses from this vast picture down to a very specific event. It says that at one moment, in immeasurable time, there were two aeons in the galactic core of our galaxy who collaborated on a DNA plasm. Now you understand what I mean by a DNA plasm? It's a plasm or a germ plasm for a species. Okay? Yeah, a blueprint. It's like a, it's like a gel, right, but it's material. Yeah. It's like a gel that contains the genetic blueprint for a species. So all the species that we see here on planet Earth, 
the birds, the fish, horses, dogs, cats, they all originate from a genetic plasm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Well, the story says that two aeons, a male and a female, who are called Sophia and Thelite, collaborated in their joy, in their ecstasy, and they produced a plasm, which was called the Anthropos in these writings. And that is the germ plasm DNA template of the human species. Yeah. So, clear enough? Clear enough. So you can say, just going into it, in the first 15 minutes here, that the Gnostic intel coming from veteran visionary seers who worked in teams for hundreds and hundreds of years to develop this material. You can say that they tell us that the human species originated in the galactic core, period. Period. Mm -hmm. Don't look elsewhere. Don't speculate. Don't presume that some extraterrestrial species of a more advanced civilization created us. No. According to the Gnostic intel, this is where the human species originated and how it originated. So, all clear so far? All clear so far. Okay, what happens next? Okay, we're going to cover the myth here up to a certain point, but then we're going to come down. I would like to come into what is our role in this myth and how we are implicated in all these events. Okay? Perfect. It really comes down to earth in a way that you'll see is rather sensational. So the next thing is the aeons as a whole. Whenever one aeon or a team of aeons or a couple of gods and goddesses create a plasm like this of a living creature, they endow it with very specific properties. This is, in fact, called the calibration of the anthropos, and it has seven parts. And I've specified how the anthropos is calibrated, and that is a matter of divine design. The divine design of the human species came out of the minds of these two aeons. Selite, whose name means the intended one, and Sophia, whose name means wisdom. Then the entire company of the aeons in the galactic core, we don't know how many there are, join together, as they always do, to project that germ plasm on a plasmic filament out into the galactic limbs. And then it just hangs out there in the limbs until it finds a place where it can nest. And in this case, it nested in the Orion Nebula, which is in the constellation of Orion. And it's the most widely recognized constellation in the world. True? Yes, understood. Yeah, and there's a nebula in it. It's in the region of the sword on the right thigh. And that is where the Anthropos plasm is deposited. Now, from that place, from that nebula, and from a particular cluster of stars in the nebula called the trapezium, over a period of time, the human germ plasm sent out filaments as plasms do. They all behave in the same way. They behave like the mycelium of mushrooms. They send out filament threads. So it sent out feelers or filament threads and, and these threads led to certain planetary environments that were floating, planetary systems that were floating in the galactic arms. And, there, and so the Anthropos seeded itself in those worlds. Okay. This is called the theory of directed panspermia, mm -hmm. which was proposed around 1900 by a Nobel Prize winning scientist and which was upheld by Fred Hoyle, the great astronomer, and by Lynn Margulis, the mother of, of the Gaia hypothesis. So again, I'm talking pure science, but I'm talking it from the visionary genre of Gnosticism. Okay? So I'm now with you. Want, <laughs> okay, so now I want to take another analogy and just imagine that the hub of the galaxy, the core, is like an observation booth. It's all glass windows all the way around. And the aeons, who you must not picture as in an anthropomorphic form, they're more like great serpents. You can picture them as great serpents, if you like. 
are looking through the observation booth out at the galactic arms and they're watching these various experiments unfold and they're really interested because they like to see what happens in these experiments they don't the aeonic gods the gods of the gnostics are not omniscient and they are not omnipotent this is a lie you have been told a lie if you have been programmed with the concept that God is omniscient and omnipotent. This is a complete lie. There is no such God. It's just a control system concept to control you. The truth is that the pleuromic gods love to see these experiments unfold on their own terms. They want to see where they'll go, how they'll develop. They don't want to interfere. So they stay inside the observation booth and they look out and they watch what happens, say, the plasm of the Anthropos creature seeded itself in different worlds. And according to the Gnostic intel, which I have combined with some Hindu mythology to get this particular feature, they observed actually that there were nine planetary systems that received the germ of the human species before this one. Okay. And so they were able to, uh, to observe from their lofty viewpoint as gods how humanity developed in nine Earth-like worlds before this one. And they were very shocked by what they saw. More so. Because they saw that due to the way that Thelate and Sophia had dosed the Anthropos, the way that it, they had dosed the DNA with very high potencies, that the species kind of went wacko and destroyed itself or destroyed the habitat that it was in during these nine planetary events. Where did you they get thought, the information on the nine? You said you, it was combined. That is nine. from the nine. That is from the Hindu mythology of the avatars of Vishnu. Okay. Okay. And it is a piece of Indian Hindu mythology that I find to be compatible with the Gnostic mythology. So it's an addition that I've made. It's an elaboration. Now this gets to be dramatic because there's Sophia along with Thelate, her counterpart, her tantric partner, if you will. And they have produced this unique, highly charged plasm of the Anthropos. And they're seeing how it develops and they're like saying, whoa, hold on here, folks. So it's almost as if it's programmed into it to self-destruct at some point. No, 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 no. It develops in such a way that it can't handle its own power. Ah. That's not the same thing. No, it's not. It is not pre-programmed to destruct itself. On the contrary, it is pre-programmed to operate at a genius level of creativity, which Sophia, the mother of our species, sees in her child. She sees her child as a highly gifted child, and so does Selite, the father of our species. And so they are shocked when the child goes wild because they have superdosed it. This is what you have to get. They have not just given it moderate intelligence, moderate sensibility, moderate capacity for violence, moderate capacity for love. They have given it extreme capacities. Okay. Okay? Yep. And as a result, they find that in nine experiments, it can't handle its own capacities. And the systems crash. Well, the Aeon Sophia, needless to say, got deeply concerned about this. And then something really extraordinary started to happen. Well, as any mother would. As any mother would. I don't think it would be wrong to apply a maternal analogy here. First of all, she was so con first of all, they all say in the Gnostic accounts that Sophia was a young Aeon. Aeons can actually be young and old. So some of the aeons in, in the Pleuromic company had done many, many experiments with all kinds of different creatures, and they'd seen it all come and go. 
But Sophia was fairly new at this. She was like, say, a young mother. You could make her as, you know, 18 or 19, very young. And she started to, in a sense, withdraw from the rest of the aeons in the Pleroma, from the rest of the gods, and to become deeply preoccupied in her own self about this creature and what was going to be the fate of it. Because there had been nine instances when the human plasm seeded itself in a planetary world, well, there were going to be more because there's plenty of plasm in the Orion Nebula. And as those filaments go out into space, they find uh, hospitable environments and another version of humanity pops up in another planetary system, you see. So she was like really concerned. And she started to do what the, not, what the uh, materials say was called dreaming unilaterally. Now, to dream unilaterally means that she pulled herself away from the other aeons in the galactic core and she started thinking all about what she alone could do to remedy the situation. She took responsibility and she also became consumed and compelled with an enormous passion for this particular creature. Her empathy for the human creature was deep, so deep, that it separated her in certain ways from the rest of the gods. You can see that? Okay, yeah. And then she began to think, like perhaps anyone would do, she began to construct in her mind, this is called the trimorphic protonoia. This is all technical from the, I can cite passages from the materials that I base what I'm telling you on. I'm not making this up. I'm making it up from the materials, okay? okay. Yeah. Trimorphic protonoia means that she said, well, she said to herself, let's put ourselves in her mind right now. She said, I don't want this to happen again. And I think it happens because they don't have quite the right conditions in these planetary systems. They can't sustain their power and the feedback loops that they form with their environments are, are, are too hard for them to manage. So I think I would like to see them to see humanity emerge in a three-body system. This is called the trimorphic protonoia. Trimorphic means three-form. So she was like dreaming or envisioning an ideal situation where the anthropic plasm could emerge. Do you get that? Yeah, yeah. And she pictured that it would consist of a planet and a sun, star, and a moon, satellite. And that would be all. Now, we know today from the latest astronomical findings, that it's very, very probable that such planetary systems do exist. Yeah. So again, this is consistent with astronomical science today. Then something really extraordinary happened. Really extraordinary. There's a line in the Gospel of Philip from Nag Hammadi, which is perhaps the most sensational line in all of that material. And it says, quote, the world system we inhabit came about by an anomaly, end quote. Now, scholars usually translate that last word, anomu, it's anomu in Greek, as mistake. But I think it is more properly translated as anomaly. So there was an anomaly in the cosmic order. This is incredible, incredible intel. Well, especially if you're under the belief that God makes no mistakes. Well, it blows that out of the water and it also makes that a very boring story, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Sophia didn't make a mistake, but she did something. She did something spectacular. She pictured the world that she would like to see humanity emerge in, in a world that would be ideally set up so that it would be able to manage its own capacities. And she knew what those capacities were because she designed them, right? Right. But she became so impassioned. The word is enthemesis. Enthemesis means enthusiasm, deep, deep burning passion. She became so passionate about the, the next version of Anthropos, which we call Anthropos 10 in Planetary Tantra, 
that her very longing to see that world come about pulled her out of the galactic core and she fell or descended into the limbs of the galaxy. She became one with the creation itself. What she did was she crossed a boundary. Normally the aeons remain within the boundaries of the galactic core. Within their observation now. That's right. Normally they do not go out in their pure form of torrential living luminosity, which is capable of intelligence and capable of feeling and capable of sentience. Normally they do not go out into the area of the galactic limbs where there is what we would call heavy matter, elementary particles, dust. Heavy matter doesn't exist in the galactic core. There is no mass in the galactic core. There is mass in the galactic limbs. She descended into the realm of mass, which is called in the Gnostic lingo, the kenoma, meaning the realm of the deficiency. And so you might compare it to this. You know what the Eden Project was like, geodesic domes that scientists set up. And inside these domes, they created an environment with plants and animals, and then they observed it, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, suppose that one of the scientists, suppose she was a young woman, who set up the Eden Project, one day left the observation booth, opened a hatch, and went into the dome. Right. And became part of the experiment. That's what she did. That's what happened to her. And this is described in what I call the fallen goddess scenario. And it is the story of our planet. So bear in mind that the name Sophia, which comes from the Gnostics, has to be applied uniquely. There are many earth goddesses and cosmic goddesses who have aspects of Sophia. They represent aspects of her. But Sophia, in her entirety, is the name of a galactic goddess before she turned into the earth. Because another anomaly that happened as a consequence of her plunge was that she actually materialized into the planet that she had previously envisioned for humanity. Okay, I see that. That bizarre situation is the core of one of the main events of the Gnostic narrative. And I assure you that you will not find this story anywhere else in the world in any other myth of any other culture. That I believe. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. Okay. So now let's just make a couple of more points about what happened to Sophia. And then we can come around to us because we are also in this story, aren't we? Yes, very much are so. Anthropos 10. You can call us Anthropos 10. Now, the conditions of Anthropos 10, that is to say humanity living on the pl- planet Earth, are extremely bizarre. Now, I ask you listeners, I know this is a lot to take in. Many of you have perhaps never heard this story before. But I ask your listeners to stop just for a moment and consider what the Gnostics had to know about life on the galactic or cosmic scale in order for them to know that our planetary system was an anomaly. I'll give you an example. Suppose you're just walking on the seashore. You and I are taking a walk and we see all kinds of crabs in the sand and in the seaweed and crabs in the rocks and in the rock pools. And we think, oh, this is really interesting. There's a fiddler crab and there are all these different kinds of shapes of crabs. We would have to know the species of crabs and their behavior very, very well and extensively. We would have to have the expertise of a marine biologist in order to notice that there was a species of crab that was mutated, wouldn't Mm -hmm. we? Yeah. Well, that's so they how had to well be the Gnostics. with all nine anthropods. Absolutely. And more and more. So I ask you to appreciate the source of this intel I'm giving you and how incomparable it is. 
It comes from seers who looked into the depths of the universe and understood things that are extremely profound. And, and that is why I trust this story and I trust this myth because I trust the experts who left it to us. Okay? Mm -hmm. So now let's pick up the Aeon Sapphire. This really gets interesting because it's not just the world system you inhabit came about through an anomaly. It came about through several anomalies, three to be exact. The first anomaly is she plunges from the galactic core. Okay. Which, which would have set off, uh, set off a series of events of anomalies. Yes, it did. It did indeed. And the first event that it set off is really a momentous event in the galactic arms. It's an event that happened before the earth arose and before humanity appeared on this planet, but it's an event that impinges massively upon this planet as I speak to you today. And that event is the generation of the Archons. I have, okay, go, for, no, I'll, I'll interject. No, what's your question? Well, sure. And so what I see is, I have this visual of she's being sort of pulled out of the pleroma, pulled out of her right. place. And in the process, because the seed had already been planted the, the, for the human genome, uh, that's a creative act. The right. Her being pulled out is a creative act in itself. Yes, another so kind of creative act. Something, yeah, another kind, not an intentional one, but something had to be, right. something had to result in it. That's right. And it's, it's almost as if it's a like a, a an aborted parasitic twin <laughs> of the original intent. Well, that's in a way what it is. That's in a way what it is because what happened was. You bring up a very good point, Lisa, thank you. Bear in mind as you follow this narrative that the germplasm of the human species is already out there in those limbs. Yeah. It's nested in the Orion Nebula, okay? So she goes in that direction. That's where she goes, obviously, because that's what has fascinated her so much. Of course. And so if you imagine, there is a thing that I learned. I wrote this myth and I restored this myth completely in early... 2000 and then I published it on metahistory.org and I published it in not in his image in nine episodes and not too long after I published this myth I read an article scientific article that said oh well did you know that scientists who study our galaxy now know that there are spikes or plumes of stellar material from the core of our galaxy mm. that Intel came after I restored the myth. So she spiked her plasmatic, divine, living, sentient luminosity, spiked like a massive plume from the galactic core, and it went all the way out very close to the Orion Nebula. And as she reached that galactic arm, which is the third galactic arm, there were, as you rightly suspect, massive consequences that she did not anticipate. Let me give you this analogy. You know a fire extinguisher has foam, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so some fire extinguishers, if you press the lever, they will shoot out a jet of foam, right? Right. Okay. Imagine now that you're up on a ladder and you're standing like 20 feet above a, a large area and in this large area below you there is a huge swirl of something like dust and iron filings mm -hmm. and imagine this is a bizarre image but it fits imagine if you take that fire extinguisher and you eject a jet of foam down into that field of iron filings you're gonna have a chaotic mess they're going to spray right. everywhere, yeah. It's going to spray everywhere. So what happened was when the Aeon Sophia arrived where she wanted to be close to the Anthropos in the third galactic arm, the impact of her massive torrent of divine aeonic luminosity created a huge splash in that area of the galaxy. And the result of that splash, however, 
would not be like the result of this silly little analogy, which would be just pure chaos and disorder. Because a neon is a living being of an order of super, super, super life, exponentially, thousands of times more complex and alive than a human being, the living quality of the Aeon Sophia imparted itself to that chaotic mass of matter. And the result was that it produced an, a freak aborted species called the Archons. Makes sense. <laughs> Does it make sense to you? I'll give yeah. you another example of confirmation. Go, I've, you've probably heard of this, go on the internet and Google the Akari insects, A-C-A-R-I. It so happens that in 1830, a young British scientist managed to produce tiny insects, mites actually, by the discharge of electricity, electricity into a field of finely ground particles. So it is a known scientific fact that electrical or plasmatic force, electricity is a form of plasma, you know, mm -hmm. can mm -hmm. actually produce insect-like creatures by a spontaneous generation. It's called abiogenesis. The abiogenesis of the Akari insects is a real fact, my friends. And it describes in microcosmic terms something like what happened when Sophia, our divine mother, produced the archons. They are our freak cosmic cousins. And they are described in the Gnostic material as an abortion. They are in the form of a prematurely aborted fetus. You know what that looks like. Big round head and spindly limbs. Well, you, you're describing what everyone refers to as the grays. In a That's way. right. So the, the Gnostic intel tells you how the gray archons originated. And it also says that there is a secondary form of the archons produced in this manner. And that is the dracona form. What would that be? The reptilians that we see the so much of that, yeah. So the Gnostic intel contains, I swear to you, this is a fact, the earliest concrete description of the reptilian and gray ET types. And it tells you how they originated. They did not come from beta recticulum. They are not part of a more advanced civilization somewhere else in the galaxy. They are the accidental product of the fall of the wisdom goddess. So to continue, but keeping track of the anomalies now, okay? First anomaly is that Sophia dreamed unilaterally of an ideal world system where she wanted to place humanity so that it could really master itself and handle the high potentialities of expression that she gave it. As a result of her passion for that 10th experiment, which we are in now, she fell, she plunged from the galactic core. Second anomaly, the effect of her plunge in the realm of the Kenoma is to produce what the Gnostics called the generation of the Archons. Mm -hmm. Now, just let me make a brief comment about the Archons. It is true that I did introduce this word into the discourse uh, around uh, 2002. That's going on 12 years now. And I have to say that I am, at moments, extremely displeased with the way people use it. Well, it's become the word that's interchangeable with the word psychopath these days. Yes, well, that's not correct. That, first of all, is totally incorrect. A psychopath is a deviant and demented human being. An archon is not human. Archons do not take human form. They take over the human mind. But a psychopath might be an ideal tool for the archons to use. But the problem of psychopathy belongs to the human family and cannot be blamed on, the, on our divine mother Sophia you don't she think did can, create the, hmm? you don't think it's you don't think psychopathy is a result of the archontic influence on humanity no it isn't psychopathy is a result of the way that we reproduce and the fact that people are born 
through the uh, through the uterine channel of a woman's body. That's what creates psychopathy. I've talked about this at length. Oh, that's a whole so, other. That's a whole other interview. By the sounds of things. <laughs> that's a whole other interview. So let's get it clear first of all that John Lash, who introduced the material, would like you to keep psychopaths in one category and archons in another. I would like you to remember that archons are an extraterrestrial cyborg species and they are not human. Secondly, I must say that I've been really upset because those who use the term archon don't tell the story that I'm telling you now. Mm. They think that they can take this Gnostic intel, which I provided to the world, and use it in any way they like. And that is stupid, it's irresponsible, and it's extremely misleading. As is anything taken out of context. Well, exactly, and especially this context. We're talking here about the supreme and sovereign creation myth, if, it, if you will, of our species. If you take a bit of the Gnostic intel out of this and use it carelessly, simply because you like to say, oh, the Archon's this, the Archon that, this is really, really bad, and I'm really upset about this. And even people like Jay Widener, I have to say his name, who should know better, do this. You know, mm -hmm. I had a long interview, 10 hours. Jay Widener interviewed me for 10 hours in Amsterdam in 2008. And he produced the DVD, uh, Planetary Tantra, The Return of Sophia, whatever. And in the process of that interview, he insisted that I relate verbally the entire myth of the Anne Sophia like I'm doing right now. And yet, nevertheless, you tell me why, or maybe Jay himself can tell me why, that every time he talks about the Archons, he completely disregards the Sophianic context of it, and he doesn't talk about the Aeon Sophia, and he doesn't say, oh, by the way, she's the one who accidentally produced them. Why not? <clears throat> I couldn't tell you. You'd have to ask Jay. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. It's not, it's not a rhetorical question. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. Now we proceed to the third anomaly, and that has to do with what you're sitting on and that's more than I mean that in more <laughs> ways than one talking to a woman but anyway the planet that we're all sitting on okay <laughs> yeah okay how do Let's we get to the third that. anomaly go back to the go, go back to the Aeon Sophia the Aeon Sophia is now caught in a kind of whirlpool because she has descended from the realm of massless luminosity mass-free luminosity into the into the sort of mill wheel heavy mill wheel armature of the galactic arms she starts to take on mass she starts to take on weight she starts to take on material elements and the way that this is described in a Christian paraphrase of the Gnostic material is typically Christian the text of the Apocryphon of St. John in its Christian version, Christian paraphrase, says the Aeon Sophia committed adultery with the Archons. That's a very puritanical image, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. She wasn't committing adultery. I'll tell you what happened. Her pure Aeonic luminosity became adulterated. Do you know what it means when something becomes adulterated? Bastard it means that it, it's right. Its initial chemical condition becomes degraded, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So it, she didn't commit adultery with the archons. Her organic light, which is the substance body of an aeon, became adulterated, and she began to materialize. Aeons are not material. They are of a different sort of material, but they are not of the material in the galactic arms. They are of the material of the core, okay? Yeah, yeah. And she began to spin, she began to tighten, she began to move into what you could call sort of an embry embryonical position, a fetal position. This is called the Tiamat or Ouroboros, the serpent eating its tail. 
Mm -hmm. and she compressed and she condensed and she materialized and because she was still dreaming the same dream for the for humanity that she had when she was in the pleroma she dreamed herself into the material earth and she became the earth and you are presently inhabiting the body of the Aeon Sophia. So the Gnostic intel, you've got to give it its due. Whether you believe it or not, whether you like it or not, I don't really care. Excuse me, i got to fix this. There we go. The Gnostic intel says the origin of the human species is in the galactic core by design of Sophia and Thelite. The origin of the Earth itself is in the third galactic arm by the transmutation of Sophia herself into the planet Earth. She morphed into the planet Earth. She is the Earth. Sophia is a name for the planet Earth. Overall, it's a be very beautiful story. It's an incredibly beautiful story, and it gets more beautiful. People tell me that their lives have been absolutely transformed by this story. It gets more beautiful the more you contemplate it, the more you place yourself in it, the more you feel the story and feel the consequences. And we'll get now, shortly, I would like to get to what are the consequences of this situation. Mm -hmm. But I want to add one more detail of the story. You know, it is a complex story, you have to admit. Yeah. It is a complex narrative. But you know, among the Navajos, the elders of the Navajo tribe would used to take three days to relate in the Kiva, to relate the sacred narrative of their creation story. How long does it take to sing the song lines of the Aborigines, which is their versions of a creation story? Yeah. Days, right? Yeah. Yeah. Days. So can you, as a human animal living on this planet, once you've been told that the planet itself is the body of a star goddess who turned into a planet for our sake, can you take a couple of hours and listen to the complex structure of a story? It's not much to ask, you know? Mm -hmm. So here's another detail, and the final detail I'll give in the cosmic perspective. As the earth was forming and as Sophia felt herself transformed into the earth, she felt many things. She felt many emotions. And the, again, the Christian paraphrase of the myth that is found in the books of Irenaeus uh, describe how she felt fright and, and fear and joy and trembling and how her emotions as a goddess actually materialized into the sky, the earth, the mountains, the oceans, the wind. It's an, it's an absolutely vivid and palpable description of an event that really did happen. And this is how it happened. And so you say every tangible physical aspect of our environment is an expression of her emotions. Absolutely. And it's a communicable and interactive expression. So, but Sophia had a problem. Not only was she turning into the planet that she had previously imagined, you know, watch out what you imagine. You know? yeah, uh, careful what you ask for, yeah. <laughs> but she had this archon infestation going on. It's, it's sort of like, uh, I would give you an example of suppose that you were a woman at a loom and you are involved and deeply absorbed in creating a magnificent tapestry on this loom. That is the tapestry of the elemental composition of the earth, mm -hmm. the gases, the minerals. She's created, she's dreaming all this, and she dreams it now as I speak. She dreams it and creates it now as I speak. But she's doing all this, but she has around her this swarm of these archons who, as if it were a swarm of wasps and locusts around a woman sitting at a loom trying to weave. Yeah. And they're really irritating her. Yeah. And they don't have a habitat. You see, they don't have a habitat because they were produced spontaneously out of the cosmic environment. 
due to the anomalous conditions of the plasma. Go see the abiogenesis of Akari insects. This is a, f a fact. This can happen. So she decided to do something at a certain moment, and this is vividly described again in the cosmological narratives. I'm not making this up. She thought, well, I've got to give them something to do, these archons. But they're mindless creatures. They're a mimetic species. They have no intention. They, they're not like the anthropos. They haven't been designed with all these fantastic, creative, erotic, playful capacities, and also capacity for violence. They have no design. They're, they're just like these drones. They're horrible, you know. Get them out of here. You know, they're getting in my hair. Ah! Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. So what she did was very clever. She projected into the mind of the archons, which is a hive mentality, a flash or splinter of her own aeonic intelligence. And it was enough intelligence to give them the capacity to create their own habitat. And they did. And that habitat is called the planetary system. It's called in Gnostic writings, the stereoma, S-T-E-R-E-O-M-A, which Scholars translate as the fundament. What is the fundament of the heavens? It is the inorganic planetary system of the archons, exclusive of the sun, moon, and earth. Why is it exclusive of the sun, moon, and earth? Well, she already created that. She already envisioned that. That's right. The sun, moon, and earth are the direct products of her dreaming power. And they represent the ideal planetary laboratory where humanity can unfold in a way that it can handle its own power. It can learn to master its own power in the trimorphic system. Using the sun to help us and the moon to help us and learning from the environment of the earth itself, we can master the design that Sophia invented for us. And in the meantime, the archons live in the planetary system outside of us. And that is an inorganic planetary system. So that's Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, those five planets principally. And so that solved part of the problem. But now we're going to come down to what we're looking at in the world today because it didn't solve the entire problem. No, 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 not by any means. Hmm. You won't get First of all, huh? you won't get any you won't argument, get argument on there. That's right. We see the problem coming, right? The Gnostic texts say, and again, I'm not inventing this. Believe me, you can go and rake through the texts 50 times the way I did, and you'll find it all in there in fragments. They said, the Lord Archon, Ialdabaoth, is a shape shifting reptilian, Dracona. And he is blind, which means he only sees by radio frequencies, not by eyes. He doesn't have eyes like a cat or a horse or a human animal. The archons are blind. They only see by radio frequencies. And because his range of radio frequencies as a lord, he's called the Lord Archon, only extended to the boundaries of the solar system, which Sophia generously allowed him to believe that he created, he comes up and he says, well, I guess I'm the Lord of all creation. And there cannot be anything else but me because I don't see anything else beyond this planetary system that my Archon cyborgs have constructed. Do you get this picture? Yes, I, I mean, do. this is like, whoa, whoa, you know. And... He's, he's, yeah. he's in his own little bubble, and he thinks that that's all he's there is. He's in his own little bubble. He thinks he's the Lord of creation. He's like Jehovah. He's like Yahweh. Thou shalt know no the gods for the entire universe. And then the archons operating in the celestial mechanics of the planetary system see, they see something. It's like a fly captured in a spider's web. What is it? It's a beautiful blue-green living planet that has been captured in the archontic planetary matrix. The Gnostic intel is the origin of the conception of the matrix. It is the origin of the conception of the prison planet 
meme. So it's and going back to the analogy of her of, of Sophia at a loom, a woman at a loom. Right. Being surrounded by these, you know, wasps that are in her hair, and she gives them the ability to create their own environment, but they create an environment that is large enough to encapsulate her and the loom. That's right. She is a witch, the woman at the loom, of course. Obviously, she would be, wouldn't she? Mm -hmm. And she has the mental power to project her mind into those locusts and wasps and to direct them in a way that they could not direct themselves. So they create the celestial mechanical system. That solves the problem of them harassing her all the time. That gives them a habitat. But the earth that is Sophia's own body becomes captured in that archonic system. Mm -hmm. And it gets worse. It gets worse. Because the archons, of which there are billions and billions and trillions, once they create the planetary system, it for them is only like a stupid mechanical toy. It's like a Ferris wheel at Disneyland. You know, because it doesn't have the living properties of what a world system that Sophia herself would create. You see the difference? Yeah. It's like an erector set version of a living animal. You can have like a living horse, a pony that runs and jumps. And then you can have like a stick figure or an erector set version of that pony. A carousel. Right? A carousel. They created an erector set carousel and they maintain it. They are the technicians of the planetary system, exclusive of the earth, sun and moon. And they're extremely bored. And it so happens because their system is mechanical, as we know, and it runs like a clock. And yet there, captured within their system, is an extremely interesting place. And so all the archons, including the reptilian overlords, turn their eyes to the earth. And what do they see? They see that eventually a filament or a number of filaments from the Orion Nebula, seed into the atmosphere of the Earth. This happens once Sophia's body has, has once her, ion, her ionic light body has been transformed into the material planet. The material planet then becomes a hospitable habitat and some of the filaments carrying the anthropic plasm arrive here and humanity arises here. And the archons behold humanity, and they are jealous of humanity. They are envious. And envy, which is phthonos in Greek, P-H-T-H-O-N-O-S, is an emotion different from jealousy. You know that. Mm -hmm. Jealousy means I might be jealous, say, of a man who has, you know, a classic Bugatti, touring car. I certainly would be. <laughs> but I wouldn't be envious. If I was envious, I would destroy the car so that he can't have what I don't have. Mm -hmm. The Gnostics are explicit in saying that the Archon species is extremely dangerous to humanity on Earth for two reasons. One, because they envy us, which means they want to destroy us because they can't be us and be what we have, have what we have. The second is due to a statement made explicitly about Ialdabaoth, the Dracona or reptilian overlord. The text says he did not observe the place where he was located. What that means is, is they violate boundaries. If the Archons merely stayed in the extraterrestrial solar system and minded their own business, and if they didn't envy humanity, we wouldn't have an archonic problem on this planet. But I think that most of your listeners would conclude with me that we have a massive archon problem on this planet. Yes, again, no arguments. And we are reaching the culmination of the war with the archons. We are reaching, we are at the turning point of that war. So those are the three anomalies. The third one being that Sophia herself turns into the planetary setting that she previsioned for us. And she now, the mother 
is not only the source of our species, but she is the setting. She provides the setting where our species evolves. And that is the absolute summation of the Gnostic creation myth. You can't feel into this myth without having it change your entire relationship to the planet itself. I don't, I don't think you can. I don't think so. And I can't tell you how many people have told me exactly that. This story, her story is it. It is our story as well. And it is in this sacred narrative that we find ourselves as a species and as individual members of that species. And this experiment that in which she placed us has design features that are totally astonishing once you get to test them and know them. One of those design features is that the human animal is equipped with the power of imagination so great, so in excess of other animals that we can understand and encompass her story. She designed us to be able to know her story. You see the beauty of that? Mm, yeah. And in addition, it gets better. She designed us to be interactive with the planet that we are on and to be interactive with so-called nature. Well, what is nature? It is nothing but the emotional, biological, and geological and atmospheric body of Sophia. So what is Sophia's next move? I mean, you talk about Sophia's correction. That's that right. Began in March, I believe. That's right. That's right. When I restored the Gnostic myth and put it in not in his image in 2006, there was one tiny little detail of the narrative that I kept back in a way. I didn't really keep it back. I just did not speculate on its meaning, okay? Mm -hmm. A couple of the cosmological texts use the word diorthosis. It's a Greek word, which is translated as correction. And it appears from the surviving materials, which as I say, are very fragmentary and sparse, but it does appear that the Gnostic seers who were destroyed with the coming of Christianity saw ahead to a moment when Sophia would correct the experiment from within. She would come to the aid of humanity and she would correct the problem of the archons and she would also provide humanity, the human species, with the power and knowledge to reach that ultimate mastery that she intended for it. I mean, how beautiful is this? Well, no mother gives up on their child completely. That's right. And she is a galactic scale star goddess mother. And she is now what I call the planetary animal mother because the planet is an animal. It doesn't look like an animal with a tail and four legs and two paws, whatever, but the planet should be considered as an animal. Now, when I heard, when I mentioned her correction in 2006, I didn't say what the correction was. And the reason why was because I didn't know what the correction was. I didn't know exactly how it would happen or when it would happen. But as events turned out, and this is a very, very long story, I won't go into any background. It so happened that in March of 2011, right about a week from the Fukushima event. That was 2011? Decoded, that was in March 2011, yes. Wow, my concept of time has just deteriorated. I know, mine is. I, I say these dates, but I, I'm fooling, I'm faking it. I really don't have much of a concept of a linear time. But this is important. I, I pin it to the Fukushima event because everyone can remember that. Around the time of the Fukushima event, whenever that was, Lisa, mm -hmm. um, 
I decoded a celestial omen that I had been observing or waiting for for over 40 years because I watch the sky and I read omens. That's one of the tasks of a shaman. A true shaman can read the sky. I read this omen and this omen told me unbelievably that the correction of the Aeon Sophia was current and that it would take 10 seconds of her time to reboot the whole planetary system and put it on the course of correction. What was that anomaly? That anomaly was that the very center of the Earth Moon system, which rotates within the material body of the Earth, reached a velocity exceeding the speed of sound. That was the anomaly. It was an actual factual uh, geophysical event. Oh. Is Super moon. The, I think I remember this. There was a Do you? there was some it was a sound that was recorded. That's right. Suspicious. There were many sounds that were recorded. Put it out. That's right. That's I right. I remember that. Yeah. That's ab that's absolutely right. First of all, there were many sounds recorded, which many of them sounded like nautical sounds. Mm -hmm. They sounded like the sounds of a ship under the stress of high seas. Yes. And I explained in the GNE, uh, GNE, the Gaian navigation experiment in the briefings, I explained that these anomalous and weird sounds, although some of them, of course, were faked on the internet, so you have to cut out the ones that were fraudulent. The genuine ones represented the stress on the mother ship, on the mother planet, as Sophia began to free herself from the capture of the Archontic planetary system. Sophia is going rogue. She's going toward being a rogue planet. That is to say, a planet that has no other planetary system around it. And we are living in the first seconds of that event. And it's so, detectable. So you're saying the, the planets that we see around us will slowly start to disappear from our skies? That's right. The planetary system itself is already rapidly changing. Jupiter, in particular, which is intensely involved with the correction of Sophia, has been changing. And it's interesting that that anomalous sound, he called it the 14-hour anomaly that was reported on suspicious observers, was a login signal between Sophia and the galactic center. During that period of time when that sound was heard, and you could hear it audibly, I heard it audibly, mm. and so did other people. During the time that that happened, she logged back on and restored her connection to the, the galactic core. And when that connection was completed, this is absolutely amazing. When that connection was completed, the surge of power between the Earth and the solar system going to the galactic core was so great that it blew out a hole in Jupiter. Do you remember that? Yeah, so she, she basically was able to reconnect, like, as you said, get back online. So it's like... That's right. Her internet came back on and her connection was reset with the Pleroma, the core There you go. Home. There you go. There you go. And in the GNE, the guy navigation experiment, I tracked with the crew of the GNE that event day by day and moment by moment. And I want you to know that I tracked it on real astronomical events and real astronomical alignments and data. And so we determined that in that period, in that summer, up until the first week of September, she reestablished alignment with the galactic core. This is the true meaning of galactic alignment. And now she can effectuate her correction with the with the assistance and witnessing of the entire galactic core and her it was special assistance from her counterpart Thelite who's represented by the planet Jupiter who you, who works through the planet Jupiter this is a momentous event but again why would he be better. why would he be working through Jupiter if Jupiter is part of the the reason is because remember the beauty of the story, if you stay in the narrative and stay in this story, don't, don't go to other stories for a while. Just stay in the story and go over the plot over and over again. And you'll find that the story itself provides the answers of the questions that it prompts. 
Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very good question. Well, why would Thelite use Jupiter? Well, there are two reasons. One is because remember that the Arconic planetary system is just a Mickey Mouse Disneyland construction that Sophia allowed the Archons to construct, thinking they did it by themselves. Right. So she could have some peace of mind as a multitasking mother while she turned into a planet. Okay? It's like using the TV as a babysitter. That's right. <laughs> and so if someone wants to send a message of truth through the television, they can do that too. Gotcha. If they take over the, take over the television with telepathic or psychotronic powers and use the television to talk to the kids who are entranced in front of the television. Just as a true psychic or shaman could do that, Thelite, acting from the galactic core, could use the biggest planet in the solar system, the gas giant, to transmit and coordinate with Sophia. Okay, the now second, it makes sense. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And so by following certain events that have happened with Jupiter physically, I mean, the, the change of Jupiter in those three years, 2011 to 2014, was noted by scientists with their jaws on the floor. It changed color. It lost its yellow stripe. You know, the aeons can do anything they want with a planetary system, which they allowed the archons to create. And eventually, Sophia will shed that system and she will become what is now recognized to exist in our solar system, that is, rogue or roaming planets that are not attached to any other, uh, any planetary system. That is part of her journey, part of her liberation, and you her said, return to the core. You said earlier on that there have been nine anthropos before. Previous. Nine, previous. Right. And, That's right. And that these systems are coming into and then out of dissolving, coming into creation and then dissolving. Is this... Archontic creation going to literally dissolve and take everything with it, or are we just being removed from it and it will continue to exist but no longer able to inter interface? It's my sense that the Archonic planetary system will drop away like a carapace, you know, like the carapace of, of a butterfly that emerges. Mm-hmm. Or a better analogy, actually, is a dragonfly, the nymph of a dragonfly. I use that analogy uh, in the GNE. I explain that the metamorphosis of Sophia, by which she achieves her rogue or roaming planet status, still with the Earth and the Moon. She still retains the Moon and the Earth because they are part of her original dreaming, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the process by which she drops off or sheds the planetary system can be compared to the birth of a dragonfly from a dragonfly nymph. You need to go investigate that and look at it on the internet. We'll do. There are some, there are some two clips of it. <sighs> okay, so there's some good okay. news. <laughs> oh, I'll give you the best news now. <laughs> okay, there are two passages. These are the best news. There are two passages in the Nag Hammadi text which refer to our role in Sophia's correction. Okay. One passage says that when she was in the galactic arm, before she turned into the earth, she saw the archons. They had created their planetary system. It's described in great detail. It's like the heaven of Christians, you know, with angels guarding gates and all this. It's like, I call it like a mafia palace guarded by angels you know, and terrible reptilians crawling around and all that kind of stuff. She's looking at the Archonic Paradise world there, and she sees the Lord Archon sitting on his cloud, the head reptilian, Yaldabaoth. And she says to him, you are blind, or Saklas. Saklas means blind in Aramaic. You are blind, and he is. I'm telling you, the Archons are blind. Uh, and you will be destroyed at the consummation of your works. I know it. It will be done by that luminous child to which she refers to humanity. That luminous child is the slang for humanity in the Gnostic teachings. So we have a prediction from the planetary mother herself that at the culmination of their works, 
when the archons have done the worst that they can to humanity, which is right now, mm. by using virtual reality, by using simulation, which is their weapon, by telepathic mind control of human beings, by corrupting our minds with implantations of religious ideologies that destroy us. There are many ways that the archons attack us. At the culmination, at the very worst moment of their work, the mother says that the luminous child of humanity defeats them and brings them down to nothing. That's part of the good news. The other part is about what the Gnostics said about correction. Although they didn't specify what it is, like, and they didn't talk about it like I do now, or at least there, if there were such accounts, they've been lost. I myself didn't even talk about it in this way until the guy in navigation experiment. I began to understand 10 seconds of her time is three years of human time. One second of her time is 108 days of your life. That is one second of her time. To give you an idea of her mindset. I came to understand in those 10 seconds that she can only achieve her correction with some measure of human participation. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it make sense? Mm -hmm. And she's getting it. I mean, look yeah. at us. And she's getting it from many angles. Look at us. We are, as it were, the darlings of this experiment. We're also the demons of this experiment. She knows what our self-destructive abilities are. We were not designed to be self-destructive. She knows that too, because she designed <laughs> us. <clears throat> and she knows how we need to act in accord with her correction. There are many, many things we can do, but I would like to say in the conclusion of this interview that there is one supreme thing, one supreme commitment and challenge for humanity to participate in her correction. That being? Eliminating social evil and terminating the enemies of life. You know, John, I know that you said the culmination of this interview, and we have been at this for two hours. Have we? We have, and I think, personally, I, I haven't touched the surface of my questions. How Are you available same time tomorrow? Yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. I'd be happy. We can pick it up from this exact point. Yeah, because this is a great point to leave it at in order to uh, step forward and move forward with uh, the next phase. And this is just such a small taste. And there are, I don't know, as you said, more questions. <laughs> the more you go into this, uh, and I know that the answers are there within it, as you said. Well, I didn't really allow you to ask many questions, did I? And, you know, I you kind of overwrote you. <laughs> huh? I didn't need to. You, you actually... Um, encompassed many of them as you went so that was good well let's uh, see in the next in the follow-up if you did prepare a few questions beforehand that would be helpful this time we just played it you yeah. know <clears throat> we just oh, played it by you and, and i had no idea what i was going to say and we just did it like this so we'll pick it up at this point at this question i want to leave all readers with this question yeah and i what think can, that that's what can, Sorry, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Well, I think what we did today was lay the a great groundwork and the, mm -hmm. the very front, the fundamental story, which needs to be told first. Yes, it really does. Because there will be a lot of people who listen to this that don't know your work and don't know the Sophia myth. That's right. There will be many people who are hearing it for the first time. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right. If you're available again, then let's do this tomorrow. We, we shall indeed, and uh, my, as my closing remark, I'd like to leave you with a saying that comes from the Naga Hill Tribe Indians on the border of Burma and India. And I used this saying in the Seeker's Handbook, which is my first book that came out uh, in 1991, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I don't have it in front of me to quote, but I think I can quote it from memory. The saying 
of these indigenous peoples goes like this. One must relate the origin of the medicine because in telling that, that is how the medicine takes its effect.